Well, I mean, I, I was born in London, um, but uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mutt. Uh, my mother was born in Kenya. My father was born in Fiji. My ancestors are from India. Uh, and you know, I, I grew up in, uh, in London and spent basically most of my time in, the, in the, the basement of the convenience store that my parents ran. Growing up uh, in, in Britain, but as part of a, a sort of South Asian diaspora, was big in ways that I, I didn't expect. Um, and, and, and there was a sort of transformative moment for me uh, that I remember, I, I think I was about six years old. Uh, and my parents had taken me and my brother to, to India to, so that we would you know, know what it is to be Indian. And uh, we, we would uh, learn some Gujarati, which is the language that my, my, my parents uh, spoke at home. Uh, and we were at a stoplight in Bombay, I think, uh, and we were inside a taxi and it was raining. Uh, and all of a sudden, there was this knocking sound uh, at the window, sort of tap, tap, tap. Uh, and you know, outside of the window was a, a, a girl. I mean, I, I imagine she was an adolescent. Uh, and in, in her hands was a tiny baby. Uh, and the baby was crying and crying and crying. Uh, and there was screaming outside the car, and she was tapping on the window asking for money. And, and soon there was screaming inside the car because I, I, I was howling. I, I, I wanted it to stop. I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted my parents to, 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 to give her some money. And then as, as we sort of drove away from the lights, um, I kept on howling. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to know why why that was why was she out on the outside of the car and why were we, were, were, were we on the inside why does she you know she not have a home and we did um how, how comes we could afford to fly to india and she could, could you know she, she, she was begging at a street light now, now that kind of experience i mean I, I i'm not trying to make myself out as as anyone special I mean, everyone has that moment i mean one of the the, the most sort of you know, something you're guaranteed to hear in any playground uh, are howls of that's not fair I mean, we all have that. Um, but for me, that moment uh, never really left me. I, I still carry that little girl around with me. Um, and after, after that happened, I uh, went back to Britain and you know, I started sort of renting out my toys to, uh, to, to my friends. And you know, their parents would give them pocket money so that they could play whatever toy it is that I had. Uh, and I would give that money to, to, to charity, to, you know, to, to aid. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing in the news then was the, the, the famine in Ethiopia. So we set, sent the money off to Ethiopia. Uh, and I, I found myself to be a sort of junior capitalist turned philanthropist. Um, but, you know, there's, there's only so much toy rental that you can do before you realize that actually the problem is still there. Um, and being exposed to the, you know, actually the, the, the persistent problems in India uh, year after year um, made me realize that actually, you know, the, you know Short-term fixes like uh, sending overseas aid, while tremendously important, are not sufficient. Uh, and you need to get to the the, the, the deeper root causes of things. Um, and I, I studied in uh, in in Britain uh, and in the United States and uh, and in South Africa, both looking for those answers and also learning from uh, from people who purported in some cases uh, and who actually did in other cases have answers to how you know, how to address the deeper root causes of poverty. One of the things that, that uh, I learned from uh, groups around the world, uh, particularly um, looking at uh, issues of hunger, um, is that the, the, the root cause of hunger isn't that there's a shortage of food. There's, there's more than enough food on Earth today to feed everyone one and a half times over. Um, we've got plenty of food on this planet. But the reason people are going hungry is not because of a shortage of food, um, but because of poverty. Uh, so, one of the, the uh, I mean, people are not sitting sitting idly by, waiting for food to fall into their laps. Um, you know, the, 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 there's, I mean, the, the, there is that kind of vision, and particularly when, when we're thinking about how how to change the world. Uh, sometimes you'll hear this this line of. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, but teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And all of us can, can kind of get behind that and think, yeah, that's pretty cool. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. But, I mean, the trouble is, think about what sort of image that, that rests upon. I mean, it, it has at, at heart the idea that, you know, you've given a man a fish and so you, a couple of guys in, in the third world somewhere sitting next to a, a flowing river and they're chomping down on their fish. Um, and they're enjoying their fish very much, and you know, they'll look over into the river and say, well, well, well what's that? Oh, it looks like a fish. 
Well, how are we going to get it out? Oh, I have no idea. We will have to wait for the white man to come give us another fish. But of course, I mean, it's tremendously disempowering. That's a nuts vision of, of how things happen in, in developing countries. Actually, in developing countries, people have been fishing for a very, very long time. Um, what the, the aid complex uh, and, and what uh, you know, modern development uh, has done for, for developing countries is impose a vision of how fishing should happen. Uh, and that, vi that vision is very unsustainable. And it comes from outside. It comes from Europe. It comes from North America. Uh, a vision that, that markets and uh, free markets and uh, modern capitalism is going to make life much, much better. And in the process, the, the ways that people have been fishing, the ways that, that, that uh, social organization has been managed, often very sustainably, is destroyed and swept away. Now, one of the, uh, the ways that people have been fighting back is, is through organizing and developing their own principles, their, their, their own ways of, of democratically organizing and sharing resources. Um, and I, I was privileged enough to, to, to come across a number of farmers and farmers' organizations and landless people's organizations uh, that have been organizing around uh, the, the principle of, of how to feed themselves. Uh, and the, the vision that they have is a vision called food sovereignty. Now, food sovereignty is, uh, I mean, the, the definition is very long. And if you're interested, you know, go to Wikipedia and, and check out food sovereignty. And it's a great definition. Um, but in essence, the idea of food sovereignty uh, is that uh, people have the ability to be able to make their own decisions about food and agriculture policy. Now, th that may not sound like terribly much. I mean, the right to be able to make your own decisions about food policy uh, sounds pretty vapid. It, it sounds like, well, you know, it's, it's a right to have rights over your food system. It doesn't seem to contain any policy. But in fact, it does. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, 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 the full definition of food sovereignty demands that there are things like women's rights being respected and uh, uh, agrarian reform so that there's you know, a fair and equal land distribution. But, but uh, I mean, the, the, the actual deep idea in the idea of food sovereignty is that we need democracy in shaping our food system. We need a, a way of uh, actually everyone getting around the table and having a conversation about food and agriculture and the way that uh, people around the world get to eat and the way that, that people around the world get to develop and, uh, and, and realize their full potential. Now, that turns out to be pretty radical because, as I say, the, the history of food policy, the history of agricultural policy in poor countries uh, has been one where people from the outside will come in, teach people how to fish uh, and or, or teach people how to grow food or uh, essentially destroy the sustainable agriculture that, that, that exists in developing countries uh, and replacing it with uh, an, an agriculture that, that uh, at the moment is looking increasingly unsustainable. Uh, and so having food sovereignty, having a democratic conversation about food is actually pretty new. Um, most countries have never had a democratic conversation about food. We haven't in the United States, but pretty much no country has had a, 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 a democratic process where people decide, well, you know, how, how are we going to make sure that everyone at a national level gets to eat and that, that we distribute food fairly and that, that we have sustainable agricultural practices so that our kids will inherit a, a planet and an agriculture system that sustains them as much as it sustains us. Right now, I mean, we're on the brink of, of, of basically emptying the oceans. We're, we're on, uh, heading towards uh, a climate change catastrophe fueled uh, in, in no small part by unsustainable agriculture that will mean that you know, in, in a couple of generations' time, it, well, there'll be 9 billion people on Earth and a great deal more hungry people than we have right now. Food sovereignty is a way of democratically getting us back onto a track of sustainability. So this goes back to uh, the, the question of how of, of root causes. Now, I mean, I'm I, I'm um, I, I'm very keen to, to, to as I say, to, to, to learn about ways in which we can address the root causes of poverty. Um, and when I was a graduate student, I was uh, I was offered the opportunity to to intern for and work for the World Bank. Um, and I was given the opportunity to you know, examine a, a range of, of classified World Bank documents to see how, uh, the, you know, how the World Bank was talking about poverty, about you know, the, the ways that it was tackling the poor. Um, and I thought, yeah, well, I'll, I'll do that. I mean, classified documents, uh, an insight into one of the world's largest uh, organizations that, uh, you know, designed to, to, to tackle poverty. I, I, I'll do that. Now, it turns out that, that the examination of these documents wasn't going to be a critical examination of these documents. Uh, instead, it, uh, it turned out that those documents were, were used to create um, a, a, basically a sort of a puff piece uh, called Voices of the Poor, Can Anyone Hear Us? Um, 
Now, I mean, it's... I mean, it, it's important to, to, to get a sense of what the World Bank does and and and, and how how it operates. Uh, and if you don't know anything about the World Bank, uh, there's a, I have a small contribution to the world of pedagogy, and and it relies on a metaphor that comes from uh, the Terry Gilliam film Time Bandits. Uh, now, if, if if you don't know about Time Bandits, Time Bandits is a film about disgruntled former employees of God. Now, the story is that God built the world in six days. So it was a rush job. Uh, and uh, God you know, couldn't do it all by himself. He had help. But he treats his labor very badly. And so they run off with a map of the universe and with its imperfections. And they use the holes in the universe to rob people. Uh, and so in one scene, they rob Napoleon. And they jump through a hole in time with all Napoleon's stuff. Uh, and they end up in Sherwood Forest, where they're met by Robin Hood. Uh, who's played by John Cleese as a sort of upper-class twit. You know, he's wearing a, a sort of bright green hat, and he calls himself Hood. Um, and Hood's very excited by all Napoleon stuff, and he says, well, this is tremendous. Well, thank you very much indeed. I, 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 what can I say? The, the poor will love this. I mean, have you met the poor? Uh, the charming people. Of course, they don't have two pennies to rub together, but that's because they're poor. Um, and, and there's a scene where, where Napoleon stuff is given away to the poor, and, uh, and you know, the, the poor are brought, and bring on the poor, and, and, and uh, Hood works the line, and he's sort of, you know, gilded mirror for you, yes, how long have you been poor? Jolly good, and you know, congratulations, you know, uh, uh, rubies for you. Uh, and right next to him is this big hulking bloke who takes whatever Hood has given and punches the poor person in the face. So that's kind of how the, the World Bank works. Uh, it's... it's, it's it's in the business of uh, you know, making these these large loans, uh, but it is also a bank, so it takes those loans back, and it punches. You know, the punch in the face comes from the policies that this organisation imposes on developing countries. Uh, policies that have, for example, in agriculture, uh, led to a decimation of agriculture in, say, Africa. This is not me making this assessment. In fact, the World Bank a couple of years ago admitted uh, that its its policies had been a disaster in uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Now. I, I, I say all this because um, there is this sort of need within the World Bank to have uh, reassurance that what it's doing is right. Uh, a, a moment of saying, yeah, well, some of, some of our best friends are poor people. Have you met the poor? We had lunch with them yesterday. They love us. And that's what I ended up doing. Uh, my, my job was uh, to be part of a research team uh, looking at these these research reports on poverty. Uh, and the... the, 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 the uh, the reports that we wrote, the, the voices of the poor, can anyone hear us, was basically a, a, a long way of, of, for the World Bank to say, well, have you met the, we, we had lunch with they, the poor, they love us. And in fact, the end of this book uh, was a, a long description about how, you know, the consultants drove up in their jeep to uh, the village and spontaneously the women burst out in song. And they, they were singing, here are the World Bank, here are the World Bank, they are here to develop us, we hope they won't forget us. And the last line of the book is, will we? And there's this thing about the way the World Bank works. I mean, it needs this kind of self-justification. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's it's not like the World Bank is filled with evildoers, a sort of you know, Blofeldian villains who are sitting in leather chairs stroking cats thinking, how are we going to fuck the third world today? It's, it's not like that. I mean, it's full of very well-meaning people, um, but they're executing policies that are tremendously bad for developing countries. Um, and the thing is that uh, as, as a citizen of, uh, of, of, of Britain and, and soon the United States, States. That means that, that this is being done in my name. The, the, the European Union and the United States are uh, the, the, you know, among the largest shareholders of the, United, uh, of the World Bank. Uh, and that means that I am politically responsible for that. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it, it, it's, I mean the, the World Bank policies are, are meant to be uh, the expression of the democratic will of the people of Britain and, and the United States. Uh, and actually taking political responsibility for the damage that these organizations have caused when doing stuff in my name means that, that you know, at some point you've, you've, got to, you've got to get out there. Uh, and so I've uh, protested the, the actions of the World Bank um, in, a, in a number of places. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be part of the, the World Trade Organization protest. So it's, an, it's an affiliated, uh, you know, ideologically affiliated organization is the World Trade Organization. Uh, and the World Trade Organization protests in Seattle in 1999. I, I was one of thousands of organizers on the streets then, um, actually standing up to, for, for uh, against a certain vision of what these organizations were doing.
saying in our name uh, against uh, we, we, we were standing up against those organizations and those organizations were, were pushing a, a development line a logic about how the third world should work on the third world in a tremendously undemocratic fashion uh, and so I mean right now I, I think now is a good time to learn democracy on the streets um, I mean th that may sound radical but, but when Al Gore is saying that, that now is the time for direct action uh, and when every mo movement of social change in history has always been achieved not through you know, a ballot box but, but through people putting their bodies on the line um, I mean I, I think that, that in order for our democracy to survive and to flourish uh, taking action against the World Bank but against institutions that, that operate in our name that are doing unjust things is the right thing for any citizen to do and uh, uh, unfortunately I've you know I'm, I've been tear gassed one, you know a, a couple of times um, never arrested though uh, I've always uh, managed to, to avoid that and, and I've always actually every time I've been tear gassed I was actually assembling legally it was the police that was uh, uh, responsible for, for you know uh, for, 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 for getting out of control um, but uh, I mean, th th these have been uh, sort of experiences that, that I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily wish on anyone the tear gas part, but but the, the the demonstration part and the marching together part was amazing, and and in fact, it was in Seattle in 1999. Um, where I'm, I first came across uh, the, the, the sort of full spectrum of this organization called La Via Campesina, which is uh, this international peasant movement of 150 million farmers, uh, landless rural workers, um, and you know, who have members in many countries, including the United States and Canada, throughout Europe, uh, and of course Africa, uh, Latin America, and Asia. Um, and th th those moments of learning on the street are, I mean, th they are tremendous. Th th they're a way of learning to be a citizen, learning to be a small D Democrat uh, in a way that, that, that our schools and our education system really haven't prepared us for. We we're not taught to be citizens. Uh, and I think that sometimes protests can be a tremendous school uh, for, for learning how, once, you know, how to begin to take responsibility for ourselves. So I, I wrote the book, The Value of Nothing, um, because it's, it's very clear that um, markets have failed us. I mean, you know, the, the, the financial crisis uh, is just one of, of a number of uh, crises that we've gone through over the past few years. You know, we had the food crisis, we had the oil crisis, um, and the, the, the bubbles in markets uh, are, are you know, obviously part of those markets. They're, they're endemic to the way markets function. And right now is a very good time for thinking about other ways in which we can value the world. Um, what we don't have uh, is a, a, a real understanding about how to value the world other than through markets, other than by sticking a price on something. But I mean, the, the, I mean, the sad thing, of course, is that even when we do stick a price on something, we still have no idea what that price means. I mean, you know, I think a Martian uh, would find it very weird that, that one of the most popular uh, uh, game shows in uh, in the U.S. and around the world is The Price Is Right, where people have to guess the price of something uh, and you know, guess wildly up and down until they you know, until they win the thing that they've uh, approximated the price to. Prices are a mystery to us in general, um, but what's more mysterious to us uh, is is other ways of valuing the world. And so what I try and do in The Value of Nothing is kind of explain, firstly, why it is that, that we've been sucked in to this way of thinking about prices, and then uh, try to figure out a way or, or show uh, the, the many ways that already exist that we can behave differently. Uh, and one of the metaphors that I use um, is this idea of Anton's blindness. Now, Anton's blindness is a, is a rare... Uh, neurological condition. It happens after a stroke or a traumatic brain injury. Uh, and it's, it's a weird condition where you believe that you can see, whereas in fact you are blind. Um, so you, 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 people who, who have Anton's blindness will, you know, will, will protest that they can see stuff, so sometimes very strange stuff, you know, sort of odd people walking through or a housing development right outside their window that they could have sworn wasn't there yesterday. But, but in fact, they're cortically blind. Um, and the, the way that you can diagnose this is, is uh, when, for example, people with Anton's blindness run into stuff because obviously they're blind. They'll, they'll, they'll bump their, their, their toe on something. Uh, and then they will confabulate. They will make stuff up. Um, about how oh I, did, I just didn't see that there uh, I have no, I have no idea that, 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 that you know someone rearranged the room when I wasn't looking um, and, and these confabulations the, the, these ways of, of self justifying sometimes elaborate stories about uh, why things that people protest to see are you know, but, but in fact aren't there uh, why reality and, and their vision of the world have clashed so, uh, so so horribly these confabulations these stories are a way of diagnosing the disease. 
Now, in many ways, the, the way that, that we've behaved uh, around the, the the financial crisis has been, oh, God, well, yeah, we should have seen that coming. And what we'll need now is just better regulation. We'll pad things out and it, it'll make the world a better place. Um, now, obviously, regulation is important, but that we shouldn't, I mean, I think we should use the opportunity right now is actually to, to, to get slightly deeper into the problem of um, figuring out other senses, figuring out other ways in which we can value the world other than through the faulty prism of markets. Uh, and luckily enough, uh, there are loads of ways in which we can value the world. I mean, in fact, uh, the most recent Nobel Prize in, uh, in economics was awarded in part to uh, Professor Eleanor Ostrom, who is uh, a professor of economics at uh, Indiana University, who's been, um, who has for a very long time done work on something called the commons. Now, the, the commons, uh, I mean, I, I had no idea what the commons meant originally. I, mean, I grew up in Britain, where uh, the House of Commons is, is basically a rowdy white men's drinking club. Um, uh, and uh, although the, the, the boundaries of that have been pushed a little bit, it's still a drinking club. Uh, and and uh, the <clears throat> when I first came to America um, and, and my you know, we, we were on holiday in New York and uh, my parents uh, were, were told, oh, well, you must go to Woodbury Common. Uh, and, and we went to Woodbury Common, which, which turns out to be this huge outlet mall in New Jersey. And I thought Common w was just American for shopping. Uh, but it turns out that Commons is, uh, a, 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 I mean, a, an ancient uh, and venerable and also a, a currently existing way to not only uh, delineate a set of resources, but also to share them sustainably and to maintain them. Uh, and commoning, which is the sort of process of, of uh, managing these, res these natural resources, invariably natural resources, uh, in common and uh, uh, within a community, that's an amazing way of valuing the world uh, that, that doesn't revolve around markets and prices but does revolve around political participation and engagement. Um, now, I mean, that, that, that may sound horribly distant to, to what we have at the moment, to, to the world that we live in right now. Um, but it doesn't, I mean, it, 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 I mean what, what's inspiring, I think, and what, what's important to remember is that there are um, hundreds of examples, thousands of examples where commoning works today. Um, and in the book, I, I talk a lot about what those examples are and how we can learn from them. So the, the title, The Value of Nothing, uh, comes from uh, an Oscar Wilde line, which is, nowadays, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, and and th this idea of knowing prices uh, is, I mean, it, it, when, I'm going to start again, uh, because that was boys. Um, I mean, to some extent, I kind of feel like I've said a little bit, I mean, I've sort of kind of right. talked about that already. Right, right, right. Um, okay. But I, I mean, I can I can take that I can take that in a slightly different direction, which is, um, so the, the opening line of, of of the book, and in fact the title, "The Value of Nothing," comes from an Oscar Wilde line: "People today know the price of everything and the value of nothing." Now, in the book, I, I explain how we might value the world differently. But I, it's not an accident that um, I, I I use Oscar, an Oscar Wilde line. I mean, beyond the fact that he's very clever, um, Oscar Wilde was a socialist. Uh, and uh, you know, in the early uh, 20th century, pretty much anyone who was anyone uh, was socialist. I mean, anyway, you know, everyone from sort of Albert Einstein to Helen Keller, socialist. Uh, and I, I think that, that it's important to, to remember that, that, that there have been political systems that have uh, valued the world differently and figured out ways of valuing the world differently um, th that have been erased um, uh, by you know, the, the, the sort of triumph of, of capitalism, by the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, th those political systems, although we, we hear very little about them, are, are still alive and well. Uh, and, and people do have visions of sharing the world, uh, perhaps not along, you know, sort of. I mean, the the lines of classical, uh, the sort of Soviet politics, and, and thank God they don't have, have those kinds of lines. Um, but but there are uh, alternatives that, that that are around us that, that are kind of suppressed, that are hidden. Um, and I have no doubt that um, uh, you know, w when people uh, read the book and find that that actually I'm not entirely critical of Karl Marx, uh, they will they will sort of froth at the mouth and brand me a communist. Um, but you know, like like Oscar Wilde, like uh, you know Albert Einstein, like like a, a, a bunch of people throughout history. I'm you know I'm, I'm not a communist. I'm just open-minded. 
Uh, and I think that, that it's, it's important to, to have a look at other ways of valuing the world, particularly when uh, we're living, uh, as Lord Nicholas Stearns has said, in, uh, right now in the, the greatest market failure in human history, uh, the, the way that we failed to value um, you know, the climate and the environment. Uh, it means that, that, that we are heading towards a catastrophe of immense proportions. Uh, and, and we do need to figure out other ways of valuing the world. And actually, th there are some pretty sensible alternatives around if people are ready to be open-minded. I'm just, I'm just trying to think of what what the what a good example is. Um, so, what what would it look like to have a, a world where we where we valued things and and where it, it wasn't the market that was allocating resources according to supply and demand, uh, but 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 there were other forces at work. Um, well, one example, in fact, an example that, that, that's springing up uh, all over the world now is something called participatory budgeting. Uh, and this happens at a municipal level. It was pioneered in Brazil, um, where the Workers' Party kind of pushed it in. Uh, and and, and, and the, the, the vision is uh, that, when, uh, the, the, that when a city is deciding how to spend its money, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea if the citizens of that city were part of that decision, as opposed to sort of faceless bureaucrats who, who are following some formula or who are corrupt in some way, making, you know, making spending allocations according to whoever bribed them uh, the, 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 the most. Uh, so participatory budgeting is, is a very interesting way of uh, assigning and allocating resources that have nothing to do with money. I mean, uh, usually I mean, the, the, the ways that these budgeting decisions are taken are by the poorest people in the city who, who get together in local assemblies and then those, those decisions are communicated up uh, in, into city-wide assemblies. Um, now, if, if, if we were going to allocate resources purely uh, according to the, the basis of a, an ability to pay, then the city's poorest residents wouldn't be able to afford those resources. But because those resources are controlled democratically, um, poor people can make decisions about, well, you know, we want a school here, we want a hospital here, we want, uh, you know, we, we want it sequenced in this order because this would be fairest and this would be, you know, this would cover the most people. Uh, and people taking political responsibility for themselves uh, and, and actually engaging in democracy um, is, I mean, we, we, get a, we can get a, a taste of what valuing looks like under that process by looking at things like participatory budgeting, which we, you know, which we find not only in, in uh, Brazil now, but actually in a number of places across the world. Um, and, and this is interesting because this gets us into, this, into a question about democracy and about what democracy is. Uh, and, and I mean, one of the things that, that I'm, I mean, I, I, I think is important for us to recognize is that pretty much none of us live in a democracy. We live in a kind of complainocracy where uh, if we whine loudly enough, um, then the bastards who are in charge of us can be replaced by different bastards uh, who are in hoc to slightly different interests um, and who will run the government in slightly different ways, uh, but are essentially sort of following the, the, the same kind of plan. Um, but that's not really what democracy like, is like. Um, um, and if you go back to the original democracy, if you go back to Athens, um, classical Athens had, uh, obviously, you know, let, let's get out of the way the fact that, yes, there was slavery in Athens, and yes, women were, were excluded. Uh, and, uh, I mean, Athenian democracy isn't something one wants to replicate, but it is something to learn from, uh, because Athenian democracy worked like this. There were no elections in Athenian democracy. Instead, uh, 6,000 citizens were chosen at random at the beginning of every year to take charge of the city. Uh, and, and they would be split up into groups of 500. And, and those 500 uh, you know, sort of courts of citizens would be the law for a whole year. And then at the end of the year, uh, the, you know, another 6,000 people would be chosen again at random. Uh, and it was every citizen's duty to take responsibility for the for, you know, for, for themselves and, and, and for their fellow citizens. Uh, and people who didn't want to do this were called idiots. Um, I mean, this is one of the, you know, the sort of original ideas of, 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 of Athenian democracy, of, of democracy itself, uh, is that it's 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 part of the, the 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 obligation and the duty of every citizen and the privilege of every citizen to be able to you know, to, to be able to, to to clean up after yourself. I mean, you know, we we all we all know about sort of personal responsibility and personal hygiene, and we're encouraged to buy the right thing and shop the right you know shop in the right place and uh, get around by the right kinds of transportation. But as soon as we try and take political responsibility people look at you like you're slightly bonkers. But it, I mean, if, if you're, I mean, if we're concerned about democracy, then that's exactly what democracy is about. Democracy is about taking personal responsibility for yourself uh, in, in a political way.
Uh, and Athenian democracy was all about that. And I think that uh, what we have at the moment is intended to de-skill us. Uh, the, the education system we have, the, the, the mechanisms for political process and engagement that we have are intended really to, 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 to turn us into, into sort of drooling idiots when it comes to political responsibility. Uh, and I think that there are movements and organizations around the world that, that, that offer us a, a glimpse into what it would be like if we did take political responsibility for ourselves. Um, and, and they're not perfect. And people People make mistakes. But of course, that's the point. Uh, w- what in, in many ways we're fighting for is the right to make our own mistakes, because at the moment we're suffering the, the consequences of other people's mistakes. Uh, and democracy means you know, getting the right to make your own, clean up after yourself and learn from it. Uh, right now, w- w- we spend a lot of time cleaning up after a, a, a handful of, of uh, sort of plutocrats. Um, and I, I think Actually, getting democracy back involves you know, re-empowering ourselves to be able to make our own mistakes uh, and to learn from them. It was very interesting uh, in uh, at the end of 2008 to see Alan Greenspan um, looking basically, I mean, looking pretty hungover, um, uh, appearing uh, in front of the House Oversight Committee, uh, where he was grilled about. Um, you know, the, why the financial crisis was happen, happening. Um, and, you know, and uh, I mean, you, you, you can forgive him for looking a, a little haggard uh, because, you know, I mean, the, the, the party had lasted uh, for, 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 for several decades. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the party of, of free markets, uber alles, uh, free markets, uh, you know, being able to, to, to be the, the absolutely the best way of organizing the world. Um, and... Uh, you know, what what, what uh, Alan Greenspan was forced to admit um, is, in his words, I have found a flaw in the ideology that I thought was uh, responsible for the functioning of the world. Uh, now, that's an odd, I mean, that, that's a fairly profound admission um, from, you know, one of the pioneers of this this kind of kooky free market libertarianism, um, uh, where you know, Alan, Alan Greenspan, of course, is sort of famously a, a disciple of Ayn Rand. Uh, and uh, you know the, the, uh, Rand's ideas about sort of free market libertarianism, uh, that, that entrepreneurs should lead the society out of the dark ages and that any kind of organizing was parasitic on society. Uh, any kind of social justice organizing was uh, destructive to society. Those kinds of ideas uh, are ones that, that Alan Greenspan more or less faithfully embodied in his pushing of the free market. Um, and at the end of 2008, it all came crashing down. Now, one of the reasons that I wrote this book is, is firstly to show how those ideas uh, you know, ascended and why they inevitably came apart at the, you know, fell to pieces. Uh, but also, um, I mean, it, it's, it's a way of, of saying, look, actually, th- th- there was a, 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 you know, a, a few decades where the, the sort of free market fundamentalists uh, were able to take control of the economy, and um, the, you know, it's going to be very hard to pry their, pry their hands off it. Um, but there are ways of, of actually reclaiming our economy from uh, the, the, these, these ideologues. And, and, and those ideas are, are, um, you know, are to be found in everything from, you know, sort of worker-owned cooperatives to, you know, I mean, you know, to, to, to banking and finance that, 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 is, um, that performs a social function rather than a speculative function. There, there are loads of different ways in which we can uh, get the economy back from um, the, the, the sort of corruptions of this, this zany free market idea that has never uh, achieved, never never happened uh, in in practice, uh, and that is seriously theoretically flawed. Um, and again, I mean, in, in the book, I, I talk about how, um, for example, I mean, even Adam Smith, who's you know, the poster child for, for free market ideas, Adam Smith never thought the free market was, uh, an unfettered free market was a good idea. Um, he, he saw a strong role for government. Uh, he, he saw a strong role for, um, for, 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 for sort of self-improvement, for, uh, for education. Uh, for, for a certain kind of moral conscience um, that, that you know that, that you will find no room for in in in, in the most sort of extreme uh, dogma of, of of the free market libertarians, um, and so it, it's important to, to remember that and important to, to actually plunder history for, for lessons that that that, uh, you know, that, that, are, that are well worth uh, you know, learning for, for, for as we try and uh, 
build a better economy. And right now is a good time to be thinking, learning those lessons and, and thinking about how we can restructure things. Because as we come out of the recession, um, and you know, although we're told that recovery is on its way, I mean, unemployment is, is still going to climb over the next couple of years. And, and no one pretends that uh, for, for the poorest Americans, things are going to get better. For the richest Americans, things are starting to turn around. But for the poorest, things are going to get worse for a good, you know, good two, three years at, 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 at best. Um, and I think now's a good time to be thinking about, well, actually, if, if, if we're not part of the plutocracy, well, what, what, what do we want? And, um, and what can we learn from the past to make sure that we, these mistakes never happen again? My my first book was called Stuffed and Starved, uh, and, and it, uh, the, the title comes from a, a strange paradox, that we live in a world where today uh, over a billion people are malnourished um, and going hungry, and at the same time, more than a billion people are overweight. Uh, and and w what I tried to do in, in the book is, is explain how it is, that not only that these two things are possible simultaneously, but how they are outcomes of the same system. Uh, so l let's, I mean, for a start, let's, let's just understand the dynamic here. Uh, and actually, you don't have to go to uh, Africa. I mean, you, you, one could imagine that the starving are in Africa and the, um, you know, the, 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 the obese are in America. I, I mean, to some extent, that's true. Um, the, the United States is the most obese country on earth, uh, and only four out of 10 Americans are, um, have a normal body weight, and uh, the, the rest of us are a little portly. Um, but but, but the, the, I mean, the, the, the fact is that there is hunger in America as well. In, in 2008, 49 million Americans were food insecure. They, they didn't know it, uh, during the year where their next meal was coming from. So it's possible to have hunger, uh, uh, hunger and obesity in the same country at the same time, and it's possible to have hunger uh, in, um, in 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 the United States, even when there's a, an abundance of food. Uh, and you know, f f I mean, it's not like in 2008 the, the, the shelves were, were emptied in the United States. But what happened was the price of that food went up, and the incomes of people went down. Uh, and that's why people go hungry in America. It's not because of some Malthusian shortage of food. Uh, it, it's because of poverty. Now, the I mean, the, so, so the question uh, that I ask is is about well, how how do we get the situation, and and also how do how do how do we get these outcomes of uh, hunger and obesity? Well, the hunger is easy to explain. H hunger uh, obtains when, as I say, p people are too poor to be able to afford uh, the, the food that that is around them, um, and the majority of the, the hungriest people on Earth today live in rural areas. Uh, this is a sort of strange paradox that the people who are the hungriest on Earth tend to be the people involved in agriculture uh, and farm, you know, particularly farm laborers, farm workers. Um, and w what I try and show in the book is how uh, the people who are growing the food are intimately connected to the people who consume the food through a kind of hourglass figure. So if you imagine you know, the, the, the millions of farmers on Earth who grow food uh, for us uh, that, that we eat, uh, and then at, at, at the bottom, you know, the, the six, nearly seven billion of us who eat every day. Now, the, but it's an hourglass figure because uh, there are millions of farmers, billions of us, but just a few corporations in the middle. So it sort of comes in like this and goes back out again. A few corporations controlling the majority of whatever corner of the, the food market you care to mention. I mean, you know, in, in the packaged tea business, uh, one corporation, uh, Unilever, controls 96% of the world's packaged tea. One corporation, 96% of the world's market. But in, in every major market, there's a, a handful of corporations that basically run the show. Now, um, those corporations have every incentive to pay the people who are growing the food as little as they possibly can uh, and to, to sell the, the food in ways that guarantee the maximum amount of profit. And that means selling food that is processed, that is high in uh, the sorts of things that make us buy more food, so high in salt and fat and sugar, the kinds of things that our bodies are hardwired to crave. And so you end up in a situation where the corporations pay the, 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 the farm workers a, a pitifully little, uh, end up uh, selling us food that, that that is obesogenic, that makes us, uh, that, that makes us fat, that, that, that makes us crave more of the food, that makes us uh, eat in un unhealthy ways. Uh, and you end up in a, in a world where you have uh, billions of people, uh, who, well, uh, over a billion people who are overweight and, um, uh, as I say, uh, millions of, uh, now over a billion people starving. Uh, and again, the, the key factor here is poverty. Uh, now, I mean, it used to be that, that if you were fat, you were rich, and if you were poor, uh, if you were, you know, if you you're hungry, you, and if you were sort of stick thin, then then you were poor. Uh, but these days, uh, increasingly, and particularly in, in rich countries, uh, obesity and hunger are two sides of the same coin. 
uh, obesity and hunger are both symptoms, one more extreme than the other, uh, of an inability to control your diet, an inability to be able to muster enough resources to be able to eat healthily and sustainably and uh, in, in a way that is good for your body. Uh, and it turns out that there are ways in which we can eat sustainably, uh, ways that, that uh, we can uh, actually you know, rebalance the food system and connect directly with the people who, who grow the food, um, that, that cut out the, the, the sort of bottleneck of the, the hourglass. But that involves some, some profound social change. Yeah.